watching Rogers TV. Focused on quality and convenience, there isn't much you won't find at Marie's Mini Mart. Homestyle bread, sandwiches, plus a variety of artisan breads and delicious single-serve desserts available exclusively at our Frecker Drive location. Marie's Mini Mart, with 25 locations wherever you go, there we are. Welcome to Sharing Our Cultures. This is the place where you get to meet amazing individuals who are contributing to the social, cultural, and economic development of Newfoundland and Labrador. Joining me today is Yao Antri Ajay, and he's the co owner of 1949 Barber Shop. Hello, and welcome to Sharing Our Cultures. And joining me today is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in Newfoundland and Labrador. He's Yao Antwe Ajay. Welcome to Sharing Our Cultures, uh, Yao. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, so um, first of all, I want to say congratulations Thank you. for being, um, well, you were nominated, but then you were chosen to be one of CBC's Black Changemakers and uh, for the fantastic work that you've been doing in our community. So you are the co-owner of um, 1949 Barbershop. Tell us a bit about that. How did that come to be? And Actually, 1949 Barbershop is, um, I would say it started with Gustavo okay. and myself. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, there was um, the idea of having a uh, community barbershop or a barbershop that focuses on uh, immigrants mm -hmm. was um, born out of this guy, his name is Promise. Okay. He started the whole thing, but he wasn't a barber, so it was hard to like, mm -hmm. get out, out along with it. So when Gustavo took over from him, mm -hmm. I came in okay. and, like the following year. I came from Toronto to Newfoundland just to pursue my master's degree. And then Gustavo sat with me, <laughs> persuaded me to work with him. And I, I took that offer. He, he was kind of appealing. Gustavo okay. is he's the man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll say the rest is history. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> yeah. we, we just kept going. I came in and I just let him know my vision, what I want to do with the shop, if he's down to it. We all get involved and then here we are. Mm -hmm. Now we have a stable and uh, a successful business. Right? Yes. Yeah. Successful and growing. Uh, yeah. Very... Here you not only have the one store at Torbay oh. Road. You know when we started we were on the um, Merry Meeting, okay. May Avenue. Yeah. Very close to this place and um, at some point when we decided to get like more barbers in, the space wasn't fitting for that. So we had a second spot at the Toby Road Mall. And unfortunately, we couldn't get enough barbers to keep both shops going. So we had to close down the one that it was on Mayor Avenue. And then along the way, we train a lot of barbers, some stayed, some didn't. And we managed to open the second location in the village mall, yeah. which is a little bigger than what we had in Tobe. Mm -hmm. So, oh, well and good, we, we're doing okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, you're doing more than okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing a lot better for many people who yeah. were closing down, uh, you know, since COVID. I know, mm. COVID, COVID was like a tough time for small businesses, I should say. Mm -hmm. But thank God we weathered through mm -hmm. the storm. And um, now I don't see the same issues, the same challenges that we faced like the past two years. Now okay. everything seems stable. Uh, okay. we, we hope it keeps going like this. Okay. And Yes. We'll see where it takes us. Right, <laughs> yes, I hope it does as well. But yeah. um, your barber shop is more than a barber shop. Oh, most definitely, and um, that is the 
idea behind having that space. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, for me, it's a microcosm of a community on its own because of what we do there, the kind of like um, interactions that we have, the clientele base that we serve. It's, it's more diverse, so we have people from all over the world coming through that small space there. So we deliberately decided to create that culture mm -hmm. inside the shop, so that when people come there, they will be able to connect mm -hmm. to their immediate community and then take it from there. So the Vaba shop in itself, it's, it's it's a great space that I love to be every day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We get the opportunity to meet people from all diverse mm. diversities, um, walks of life, like people, professionals, what have you. We get the opportunity to meet all. Mm. And we don't take that lightly. It's mm. something that we're very mm -hmm. proud and happy about. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because I know whenever I go by, there's a line of people waiting to go in. So what do you think has made it so popular, so successful? I mean, I think it's, it's more to do with the people that we have there as barbers. I call them my family, actually. Like, we have such a great team there that everybody you see in that space shows respect to like anybody that comes to that barber shop and for me that gives confidence to people who come in every now and then mm -hmm. and if you feel you belong to that space then the probability that you will come back is high and our retention rate has been mm -hmm. it's good Good. Yeah. yeah, we get new people coming in every day, just because of word of mouth. People go out and they speak well about the shop, their experience they had there, the music we play. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I I bring African food there <laughs> just for people to have a taste and all that. It's it's such a unique environment, and mm -hmm. even the barbers themselves, we have barbers from different different backgrounds, different countries, different continents. So as as of speak with you now we have my I'm from Ghana of okay. course and um, Gustavo my co owner is from Colombia. I have Eritrean, Sudan, I have um, Bahamas, I have um, Iran, Iraq, I have a Canadian like just the work workforce itself is mm -hmm. so diverse mm -hmm. and i'm sure you know what diversity brings mm -hmm. to a space like that mm -hmm. we try to learn from each other every day yeah. it's such a beautiful space to it, work yeah. it is most definitely if i could be a barber i'll be working there <laughs> For sure, it's a little <laughs> mini United Nations exactly, you've, you've got going. Exactly. And I think o opening up for conversations, people to come in and feel it's home. As you said, yeah. uh, your co-workers or the barbers, they are like family to you. And it's like coming home when you know your clients come in. They're not really clients no, then, no. right? Yeah. It, like, and, and the community that we find ourselves in, Newfoundland in particular, I was talk about St. John's, mm -hmm. the people here, maybe for me but i think it's the general consensus mm -hmm. like i'm really good mm -hmm. and they are always willing to help at every point in time when you face like difficulty you can it, it's rare to see a barber having that close relationship with their clients to the point that you can call them anytime not necessarily for a haircut but to talk about like any issues in life or and I have clients reciprocating the same thing giving me a call to talk about random issues so it's it's such a unique place here in Newfoundland to have people like that and when you get such opportunity you 
you cannot take that for granted. So we also try as much as we can to give back to the community mm -hmm. any way that is possible. So mm -hmm. that is, and I, I don't know, Gustavo, I don't know <laughs> what to say about that guy. He's, he's, he's a unique individual. Like, right. Well, that's good. And I hear you have a pool table in the, Avalon yeah, in the village mall. Yeah, yeah, in village mall. Like <laughs> when, when um, the barbershop, the idea of opening another one in the village more came. We didn't have COVID, so we wanted to have that fun space where people can just come and hang out, not necessarily come in to have a haircut. But then COVID happened and that whole thing. So we have a pool table in the middle of like the shop. So you have people sitting, having their haircuts and people in the middle also playing either like ping pong or mm. pool, yeah. which is really fun. Yeah. But like I said, COVID did not make us realize the full um, like intent mm. why we put that there. But mm. it's, it's been fun. It's mm. been very fun. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess it's building up now. Since oh yeah, right now, like, I would say towards the last quarter of 2022, things began to normalize. Mm -hmm. Like people, like since they announced uh, mass mandate, not no more and forth, like people are coming up more and more, and then it's beginning to come back, where you have a lot of people sitting in that small space. Some just come to enjoy music, not the haircut. Some come to have conversations mm -hmm. inside the barbershop. And because we have like these soccer teams as well, we mm -hmm. try to get people involved in the community, in the sports that they love. So mm -hmm. that's, that's something that's working out very much. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's definitely working out. And I know <laughs> that your heart is for the community, I see in everything that you do. Yes, yeah. um, I, I, I should say I also benefited from SIM. Like mm -hmm. when I came, I met people who didn't know me, but they opened their arms and they work on me here. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I feel it's it's like a responsibility that I have to also replicate same. So I try in many ways as I could just to also get myself involved in the community building, not like only for a certain group, but everybody. Yeah. So okay. I've been trying. I I am serving on um, anti racism um, working group. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going Jones. to let you hold that thought for a moment. We're going to take a short break okay. <laughs> and then we'll come back to All that. Right. Thank you. Um, Shana Cultures will be right back and we'll find out more about what Yao is doing in the community. Welcome back to Sharing Our Cultures and my conversation with Yao. Now, when we uh, finished off, uh, you were talking about your participation in the, or your volunteer work with the anti-racism committee. Can you yeah. tell us a bit more about that? Ah, uh, yeah, I, I, I saw like um, an ad, and when I look at it, they were calling for people to serve on that committee on a voluntary basis. So. I thought, why not? So I, I submitted my application and I got chosen. And we've been working since. Um, we are now working on a um, few stuff. We are not fully like into the main work, but we are trying to fashion out our frame of work and then other stuff that needs to be in place before we can't catch that. So, and I, I think that is one way that I can give back to the community, mm -hmm. especially the 
um, the minority groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I took that opportunity and I'm looking forward to get more involved in the things that we do. And also, um, the soccer teams, we, we, the, the barbershop actually uh, has a soccer team. Oh. Yeah, 1949 football club. Okay. We've been involved in the league in St. John's, the men's league for three years now. Yeah. So I, we came up with that idea because in the barbershop, we get a lot of people coming in on a daily basis trying to find something to do, either any sports that they prefer. So we realized, like, my background and Gustavo's, that is the sport that we're very deep involved. So we try to create that space to get people more involved in the league. So we came up with a team, and now I think my team is the most diverse team and also in terms of roster we have the biggest number of players yeah. okay. so that's working out people mm -hmm. are having fun and they are getting to like um i would say integrate well into the society by having those opportunities so okay. that's that's mm -hmm. very well right. yeah so how were you able to recruit members of the team uh, in fact that, that, that that's the easier part for for us because of the barbershop almost almost i would say almost every newcomer that comes to the city mm -hmm. end up coming through one way or the other either they're coming with friends or they themselves are coming for a haircut and we do have like like i mentioned before we do have an, open conversations in the barbershop. We talk about everything and every time there's an element of sports happening there. Mm -hmm. And people come, they keep asking, oh, I am a footballer. How can I join a team? And, uh, and before we used to recommend them for other teams, but I would say about 90% of them that didn't get a chance to play until like we said, okay, why not having our own team mm -hmm. so that we can just get people more involved. And then we started that the first season we were um, we we got out in the semifinals, and then the second season we were first runner up. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like something that just came about. We are actually mm -hmm. participating and we are making our presence felt in, in, in the field of play, which mm -hmm. is good. So the yeah. guys are loving it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can imagine soccer is a big thing for many. Oh uh, yeah, it's like St. John's it's it's becoming such a huge sport. I know hockey and other sports, basketball in Canada is big. Mm -hmm. Soccer hasn't received that like prominence, but over mm -hmm. time I think it's going to become a big thing here too. Now that Canada is expected to be hosting, co-hosting the World Cup, okay. and our participation in the just um, the last World Cup, mm -hmm. I think it's opening, it's, it's going to open doors for like soccer to get more like attention mm -hmm. and develop. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's good. <laughs> so how were you able to find somewhere to practice? Like where do you practice this, this mm -hmm. soccer? Mostly what happens is in the winter we do practice indoors. Okay. It's a space that you have to pay and then have like an hour or an hour and a half okay. practice. So we do that and um, in the summer we have open areas around okay. pitches mm -hmm. and fields to just practice. But in the league there are designated um, sports complexes where we play the league. It's very competitive so that's, that's something that is working now and we have 
other companies that come in to support okay. in terms of sponsorship and help everything that we're trying to do. It's, it's been working out really good. Okay. I don't know if you, um, Phil Robbins, PR group, they've been supporting the team since inception and uh, other companies too. Um, uh, Acme now I think they changed the name I don't really go mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so there are companies that are on board helping to like build this sports and it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of positive yeah. yes yeah well congratulations <laughs> that's another big thing that, <laughs> that you're Thank doing you. yeah. now I know you've mentioned 1949 you know your 1949 soccer team and 1949 so where did this <laughs> date come about? <laughs> Actually, the date, um, it was something that was discussed between Gustavo and myself. Because when we took over the barber shop, it used to be called Rouge. <laughs> but for me, I didn't like that name because it didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It didn't have meaning, in my mm -hmm. opinion. So we were trying to get something to replace that. And initially we were talking about different, different names and Gustavo said, let's get numbers. Numbers are easy to remember. So we were thinking about 709. Okay. And when we checked, it had already been taken. So we came up with 1949, which is the um, Confederation date, the date of which Newfoundland became part of Canada. I said, why not? So resonating, so we check, and the name was available. We just took it, and over time, like it became known to everybody so quick. It's almost like a household name for like people, and it's it's been working out very well. Yeah, also. that was a good choice, actually, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> because it has so much meaning for exactly. the you know for the whole exactly. province. Yeah. yeah. It actually yeah. gives you the identity mm -hmm. where we are and where we operate from, okay. which is yeah. good. Yeah. Mm. It's timeless. <laughs> yeah. So um, when you have clients come in or you, and they are having conversation, is there any particular topic that I know they talk about sports and soccer? Yeah, <laughs> Anything sure. else that they talk about? Maybe any information about how they are integrating or any it's challenges they're having? Seriously, like. We talk about almost everything. Talk about race, talk about jobs, talk everything. Mm -hmm. And there are, at times, some of the conversations become so awkward in an yeah. in environment like that, where you have diversity. You have the local people, mm -hmm. white, black, mm -hmm. what, Hispanic, whatever. And Sometimes <laughs> you can't help it. We just let people express mm -hmm. how they feel. And mm -hmm. what really stands out for me is um, how people feel about Newfoundland. Okay. Like every newcomer that you talk to, they, 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 what they don't miss is telling you how nice the people are. And that is very good. Even though in, in a rare cases you have people who will be complaining about having been racist against all mm -hmm. this or that, discrimination and all that. But that's, like I said, in the rare cases, most of the time it's about positive impressions that people get in this community. And that is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. And also, we talk about lack of jobs, mm -hmm. like why people keep moving out. And almost like everybody you talk to will tell you, especially the students, I moved because I didn't have, I didn't get a job after school, after my studies and that. Mm -hmm. So we, we talk about so many things there. And yeah. well, I'm sure it's something that the community can 
let's focus on that and try to see if we can resolve issues okay. Yeah. Okay. Now we have a few minutes left, but I do want to talk about your new venture as an entrepreneur uh, into cars. Yeah. <laughs> it's something that I've been doing. I, I, I did that back in Toronto even before I moved to Newfoundland. I was shipping used cars back home. And I kept doing that whilst in the barber shop as well. But now I have decided to have like a local company here and get involved in this exportation of used cars and sales as well. Mm -hmm. So I got a new place on Thorburn Road that I'm working it out. Yeah. Hopefully in the few days coming, I'll be able to get it properly structured and mm -hmm. get that. But in doing all this, I think the person that giving me the backing is my wife. And she's from here too, mm -hmm. Julian. Yeah, she. <laughs> in in if if I if I can tell one difficult issue for me in getting myself involved in all this, it's finding the equilibrium, mm -hmm. the balance, family and work, because I'm out almost all the time, and we have kids also so for her to keep supporting me doing what i do and also help in raising our kids i think i owe everything to her and i'm i'm very passionate about family family for me is everything so i dream family i sleep family i everything i do is family first so i'm, I'm happy i i was I'll say <laughs> <laughs> to have you. Yes, yeah. she's an amazing wife, you know, and uh, and your children are just, you know, <laughs> super. Thank you. Thank so you. thank you so much. We really appreciated you coming and spending the time here with us. Pleasure. We know we couldn't have Janine with you because she's with the children. <laughs> but, uh, it's nice yeah. to have you and thank you for recognizing, you know, her work in your life and in all the Pleasure things you have mine. achieved. Thank you so much Thank for you. having me. You're I very really welcome. appreciate that. You're very welcome. And sharing our cultures will be right back. Thanks to Yo and to you for watching. Join us again next time for more amazing individuals who are making a difference in our community. If you want convenience, Marie's Money Mart is here for you. A one-stop shop for a variety of products, homestyle breads, sandwiches, plus check out our freshly baked artisan breads and single-serve desserts exclusively at our in-store bakery on Frecker Drive. With 25 locations, wherever you go, there we are. At Sharing Our Cultures, our programs, projects, and events focus on engaging school children and youth from diverse cultural backgrounds as they integrate into the society in Newfoundland and Labrador. We connect them with the locals and community partners for opportunities to improve their socio-cultural and employability skills, and most importantly, to make new friends. We invite you to learn more about sharing our cultures on our website, YouTube channel, and social media platforms. If you have a comment about this program, we'd love to hear it. Email or call us, or send us your feedback through social media. <laughs> well, I'm not driving. I'm way too stoned. How are you feeling, beer? Oh, since we had that talk, I'm not driving tonight at all. What, what about, about you, Dave? Dave? You only had a couple of drinks. And only a couple of puffs. I don't drink and drive. No way I'm getting behind the wheel when I smoked weed, too. How are we getting home, then? You can drive, Dave. Come on, Dave. Take one for the team, buddy. Don't let weed and alcohol influence your decision to drive. Yeah, I need a ride. I'm Lloydetta Quickle. 
I'm here at the rooms where we just finished recording the Sharing Our Cultures series. This is a place where you get to meet amazing individuals from diverse cultural backgrounds who are making significant contributions of Newfoundland and Labrador. This is Rogers TV. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Backyard Bartender. I'm Brian O'Connell, and uh, if you've been following along, we've uh, talked about uh, older cocktails, we've talked about whiskeys, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite drinks, which is gin. And uh, there are any number of gins that we're going to experiment with today. But we're going to be uh, not local, but uh, kind of in the uh, regional area. And we're also going to talk about uh, making your own syrup. And we're going to talk about foraging for some things that you can use in your syrups and uh, some of the other things that you can mix with your gins. Now, I am not an expert, but uh, Leslie Ann Corrigan knows a little bit about it. And uh, she is part of uh, the Outdoors Newfoundland and Labrador show. And we'll be talking to her about that. And she'll be making three of her favorite cocktails featuring gin. So stick around, pull up a chair at the bar, and we'll be right back with Backyard Bartender. Welcome back to Backyard Bartender. I'm Brian O'Connell, and our special guest today, Leslie Ann Corrigan. And uh, she's uh, a rather interesting person because, uh, well, in that you have uh, had your own radio program, mm -hmm. and uh, you've worked as a bartender. I have. And uh, you do something really interesting, which I think a lot of people would find fascinating. You forage for uh, different botanicals and that to use in drinks. I have done, we'll say. I'm not really a forager so much, but I have gone. But I think all of us are sort of foragers that we don't really think that we are. Berry picking is foraging. True, yeah. If you go and you know gather a few mussels, if you happen to find them on the rocks, that is foraging. And of course, if you're a hunter, like so many people in Newfoundland and Labrador are, that is foraging and hunting and gathering is a big part of our our whole culture here in Newfoundland and Labrador. That was my next question. Newfoundland and Labrador is a great place for that, right? Definitely. It is the, you know, one of the best places in the world. And I think like a lot of times with Newfoundland, we often look at other places in the world and think that they do things better than we do. We have a bit of an inferiority complex, but I'm really happy to see that we've kind of taken center stage with this live off the land movement that's happening around the world and we've stepped up and become you know worthy of the things that are around us that we can use in our food and drink and sharing that with the world so can you go out and live off the land i think i could if i had the right people I'm not with ask me. You to do that in the show, <laughs> if i had some the right company and okay. the right tools yes right, so how many years were you attending bar i well i worked all over downtown and i worked as a bartender and a server and i worked as you know, in the pit, as they say. So yeah. I've, I've I went through that university while I was going through university myself. So I worked downtown for the better part of a decade, we'll say. But most of my experience was not cocktail based. So I can pull a pint. When you do, when you install some taps, <laughs> I'm going to do a black and tan. I actually do have a, 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 a tap. But, uh... Call me back. <laughs> okay. I'll do a black and tan for you like you've never seen. But no, I since then, and of course, working in the outdoor industry, like you said, with the radio show and things like that, I really got to see what was happening with cocktails and food and drinks and whatnot. So I've gotten a, just an interest in it. All right, well, let's get started. What are we making today? So when you said you wanted to work with gin because it's your favorite, I was delighted. <laughs> because too. gin is, is one of those spirits that really takes on, and of course it's blended with botanicals and all of the best gins around the world are made using the things that these companies and, and stills have around them. So mm -hmm. Newfoundland has a, a few great distilleries. There's other ones across Atlantic Canada and over in Scotland, things like that that we're going to use today. So we're going to start with the Gimlet. Okay, so we're going to use a, a gin from Nova Scotia here. For this one, exactly. Okay. And so what I've done is, like you mentioned, we're going to do with a simple syrup. So um, typically if you're making, you know, when I worked downtown, it was all grenadine and things like yeah, that, yeah. you know, prefabricated syrup. But you've made syrup. this yourself. I did. So all it is is one part sugar, one part water, and you boil it. That's your simple syrup. What I did was I threw a few partridge berries, literally a handful. Ones that you picked yourself. Yes, of course. <laughs> and if they're in the freezer or if they've been overwintered, they're the best. Okay. So never use your partridge berries the first year. Freeze uh -oh. them. Good to know. Good to yeah. know. And then, oh, sorry, okay. we're throwing things in the bar already. I love it. So, um, yeah, so we just, some spruce and just put it in there, much okay. like you use rosemary. All right, well, so I'll we let boil you get that and let it thicken up. So, okay. yeah, I mean, all we do for this is I always like to chill the glass a little first. Yeah. 
they even have their own glassware. Yes, they do. Yeah. It's awesome. And there's some, you know, businesses in Newfoundland, like the Newfoundland Distillery, there's a new one coming now, Wooden Walls Distillery yes, coming, yeah, yeah, yeah. downtown St. John. So there's companies that are doing exactly what, you know, has been happening all over the world. They're doing it right here, right now, and using these things that are around them, which is great to see. So what we're going to do is we're going to take half an ounce of the uh, simple syrup. Put that oh, in there. Thick. Yeah, okay. It is thick, so you want to reduce it down. It takes yeah. about 10 minutes, okay. you know. Uh, and then we're going to do two ounces of this. This is a blueberry gin from Which Stein, is gonna, Steinhardt. Yeah, so it's going to work really well with the partridge okay. berries, I think. We've got like a, a berry. So the two ounces of this. All right. Wow. Okay. Are you ready for this? I am, yeah. <laughs> you ready for this? And then we need the juice of a whole lime. So typically you'd say, you know, an ounce of, uh, of lime juice, but in Newfoundland with our skimpy limes and what we're left with by the time they get here, we're definitely going to need the full, you've got all the tools, Brian. I'm used to using well, just my hands. If that, well, I figured if I was going to have bartenders around, real professional bartenders, I, I better have something for them to work with. Well, you know what? You're, it's very, very much more fancy than I'd get if I was off living off the land. <laughs> I wouldn't make many gimlets in yeah. uh, the woods, though, I don't think. All right. So get the full lime juice there. Okay. And so we just add a bit of ice in here. And a little shake. We discard our ice back there. We don't want the ice. We just want the, no, the chill glass. cold okay. glass, right? And then here we go. Oops, making a mess. It's a very large glass for a very concentrated drink. Well, that's fine, though, because I think, you know, we were talking about this in earlier shows. Uh, you begin having the drink. Uh, you smell with with it first. You smell it, and then you, and then you taste it. It's right? the you full know. experience, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. I hope that in this, then, that you'll get um, the the taste, the smell rather of the spruce, of course, first, and uh, then the taste of the partridge berry. I love partridge berry. It's probably one of my favorite flavors. And what are we putting um, in here? So now? just a bit of lime, and normally I would kind of. Put the spruce. Hang it over the glass. Oh, yeah, nice we'll have to do that with such a big glass because sure, okay. I don't want it swimming around in there. But yeah, so there is a gimlet using the Steinhardt gin from Nova Scotia and the partridge berry and spruce syrup. I don't know if I can recall if I've ever had a gimlet or the last time I, I did have a gimlet. So it's uh, a nice, refreshing summer drink. Well, um, it is. It is a, a has a lovely fragrance to it. Yeah. And uh, believe it or not, you can smell uh, a little bit of the, uh, what is this here? This is so a, this is spruce. Spruce, okay. Oh, Brian, before we go oh, on, I'm oh. sorry. I'm trying to make this into a, uh, a three ring circus <laughs> event here today. We forgot to add the soda. So you just want to top it off with a little soda. Just a little soda, okay. Just a little for the okay. bubble and just to thin it out a little right. bit. Well, so. here we go. Let's try this. <laughs> this is a gimlet made by Leslie Ann. Da, 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 da. It's such a large glass. You've got to wait for it. But you. you know what? That's so refreshing. It is. Yeah. And you you know, you're you're not tasting gin. No, you're going to taste the syrup because yeah, it is so you, sweet. You taste the syrup and you taste uh, um, some of the other... Um, I, I don't know what else was in the syrup. There's this partridge berry and spruce. So did you spruce. get the partridge yeah, berry? I'm getting a little bit of spruce. I thought it was the spruce was coming from the side, but it's not. It's a... It's all your senses working together. So, mm. I, and like you say, I mean, I've seen so many people do such wonderful things. Well, that and that is just delightful. Excellent. Yeah, I'm it glad. really is. All right. So, uh, uh, Steinhardt Gin from Nova Scotia and uh, locally foraged, what we call these uh, uh, ingredients. Ingredients. We'll say, yes. Yeah. And of course, make your own simple syrup and uh, you get yourself a, uh, a beautiful gimlet. And uh, if you uh, want that recipe, uh, keep watching and we'll tell you how you can get all of these recipes. Leslie Ann Corrigan joining us today on Backyard Bartender. What are we going to do next? Well, next uh, we're going to make a martini. I oh, believe those are your favorites. That's one of my favorites. So yes. no pressure. All right. If you're a martini <laughs> fan, stick around. We'll have some fun with that when we come back here on Backyard Bartender. Welcome back to Backyard Bartender. I'm Brian O'Connell. Leslie Ann Corrigan from The Outdoor Show is joining us today. And uh, she's a forager from way back. We've been talking about foraging uh, for uh, all the things you need to uh, have in your own bar at home. And you've given us a couple of great tips today. But now we're going to move along to something that I really like. It's a martini. 
You do. You told do. me that. I do. And, uh, you know, I've had good martinis, and I've had martinis that are not so good, but... Uh, what makes a good martini? I don't know. You tell me since you love them so much. So this is the thing. Like I'm a, I, I pull pints. So when you told me you want, I can easily make you a martini. Right. I've made many, but I'm, I'm not a martini lover. So what do you love about a martini? Well, I like it to be cold, okay. you know, uh, it, it, somewhat refreshing. And you don't, you don't want a lot of them. You know, the old saying, one martini, two at the most. And even that would be too many. Uh, but uh, I like a good gin with the martini. Okay. Right? And I never quite know, you know, when you're mixing the vermouth, because some people like a lot of vermouth in, in a glass, uh, in a martini, and some like a little sprinkle, but I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know, you know, I think the cold glass is what makes it for me. Mm -hmm. so. And what about your garnish? I know that's very important. <sighs> olives. Olives? And I found these all olives that are stuffed with almonds, and I know some of you purists are going, no, 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 but they're really good. <laughs> and it's kind of like a little meal before and or after you're having your martini. So you want several olives, that's the thing. <laughs> but, but some people do like that. I mean, sometimes you see them with the, the string yes, of olives, yeah. so that's your thing. They go yeah. on forever. It which, looks which, nice, it, though. It does, looks yeah. classy. And there's something about a, a martini, uh, when you sit down to have a nice meal, you sit down and have a martini, there's something grand about it. You know, you know I'm a huge classic movie fan, and martinis for me are just that they are that you know extra say, special go story on, say, <laughs> the movie is oh i was a huge i'm a huge thin man um fan okay, so i so love everything goes back to radio <laughs> that was a uh 1940 from, from 1941 to 1950 i think it was a radio play okay um ah, what was the guy's name Damon. So in the movie, it was it was William Powell and Myrna Loy. So okay. they were the married couple who were solving movies, but mostly they just drank martinis. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I'm, well, let's not break with tradition. Right, let's so, get right to it. So, but I don't remember the the radio show. Was that on? It was when an you actual were, radio. Okay. Not, well, <laughs> no, I'm not that old, but it was a radio show. Thank okay, you. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome <laughs> okay, so according to the recipe that I was provided for this, oh, so you, someone gave you a recipe. <laughs> it had to. All right. It's okay. not very hard. All right. It's uh, it's just you know two versus one. So now, are you going to chill the glass as well? I am going to chill the glass because you really want a cold glass. Yes, so we've heard that. Yeah, so I'm even chilling the metal first okay. because it's a nice hot day here. Yeah, it is. So it did is. you order this up for us? I did. Today? Yeah. And uh, every time we shoot uh, backyard bartender, I uh, call Environment Canada and tell them I need a nice warm day. So here we are. You know, you've got a direct line. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. So what gin are we using? With so these? we're going to use Hendrix gin. So Hendrix gin is fairly well known. It's uh, from the Grant family, the Scottish family. They mm -hmm. do the scotch that everybody knows and loves. Um, but this is their gin. And so much like what we were talking about earlier with the foraging, um, they use botanicals that they find around them in Scotland. So as you can imagine, it's similar to what we're going to find here. So the tastes will be familiar to you, Okay. Um, but should be refreshing like okay. you said with your cold glass and how much gin are we going to use so uh we typically use like a two to one quarter okay. kind of ratio okay. so uh two ounces of gin to a half an ounce or two to a half so you okay. do the half ounce of vermouth but again you mentioned earlier that that's a preference so how would you normally you just kind of want to go by the recipe i'll go with whatever you go making. let's go with the recipe sure. then if we need to adjust later right. so this is the gin that people might remember it now because they have a, a big TV campaign oddly infused with rose and cucumber yes. you may have seen so I um, actually have one of those yes so this is the Hendrix gin that they're that they're talking about so we're going to see if we can pick up the notes the rose okay. and the mm -hmm. cucumber I'm going to help you and I'm going to put one right there by your nose so the okay. same thing with the last one <laughs> we're going to smell it then taste it all right so we've got the the gin in there then we'll do the vermouth so okay. we typically like to use an extra dry vermouth yeah, and I was uh, difficult to source an extra dry vermouth uh, so I had to go uh, with what was available to me. Yes. So, well, I mean, again, I don't know if there's a huge market for martini drinkers. I don't know if there's many classic movie fans out there <laughs> who like to pretend oh, they're I bet Myrna there are. I bet, I, Well, there will be after we're done here. Uh, there definitely will. Uh, yeah. People uh, are going to take us off, as my mother would say. So before we go any further, the question remains. The question of the hour when you're making a martini, shaken or stirred? Shaken. Lick it. So you're not afraid to bruise the gin, as no, they say? No, no, I'm not. No, no I will no. going to use that you've given me the perfect segue because actually one of my favorite uh, quotes from the Thin Man is that he says, you know, that the, the drinks have to be shaken to a rhythm. So one of the rhythms for the uh, martini is to the waltz. So we're going to shake this to the waltz. <laughs> you don't want to shake it too much. 
Oh, so I, we'll, did not, yeah. I did not realize that. Yeah, that's apparent. We've had a number of bartenders here, and they all have a certain technique for Some really yeah, like to yeah. shake it. With a well, cocktail, like a, drink, a fruity cocktail, okay. you probably want to shake it. But I'm just following William Powell now, so he said to the wall. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then we're just going to pour it in here, and we'll add your olives. So what about the olive juice? Do you bother with no, the dirty no, martini? No, I, no, I don't, uh, don't enjoy that at all, no. So mm. far, so good. So looks, far, so it good. Looks very it looks familiar. very refreshing. So we're going to add this garnish, like I said, and it will kind of heighten your senses mm -hmm. um, before we go in. And we've got a toothpick to gather your olives. And we're going to do a couple. And as I said, I, I use these uh, uh, all olives that are stuffed with almonds, which I particularly enjoy. They so, do look lovely. They do. So there you go. There's your classic martini. It's a classic martini. With uh, Hendrix gin. Hendrix gin. And this is, uh, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll take that from you. And uh, give this a give this a go. A nice garnish, by the way. Thank you. Hopefully, it helps. <laughs> I think that's important for people to kind of consider when they're thinking about the garnish too. Is that it adds to the flavor. It certainly does. And uh, I think also, when you make a martini yourself at home, it's not quite the same when somebody makes a martini for you. How does it stack up? It stacks up really good. You've done a very good job on this. Phew. You know, you can probably leave the pulling pints behind you and get into the, uh, the martini I tray. might not have as much business as I would have around here <laughs> pulling pints. Well, this is really, really good. Yes. A, a cold glass, the olives are great, uh, the garnish is wonderful, the gin and the vermouth both complement each other. Probably the vermouth could be a little drier, but as I say, it's difficult to source that here. But if you're going away and you're coming back home, you can probably do that. So uh, if you'd like to try the... Uh, classic martini in your backyard bar. Uh, this is one of those that you can try. And if you like uh, olives that are stuffed with almonds, try those too because they're quite delicious. I know some of the uh, purists would say, no, 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 no. It's got to be just your, your, your regular olive, but uh, that is quite good. Leslie Ann Corrigan. So uh, that's two down. We've got mm -hmm. uh, the gimlet done. We've made the martini. What is coming up next? Next is one of my favorite drinks, a classic gin and tonic. But of course, I'm going to add a little few little shenazi things okay. to that, too. Well, and why is that your favorite drink? I just find it very refreshing. It's very light. It's never, you know, if you're out with friends and it's not complicated, yeah. everyone knows how to make a gin and tonic. It's not as complicated to make, even though a martini has, you know, less sort of complicating steps. Yeah. It's that balance between the, the ingredients. But a gin and tonic, g and give her. I think, yeah, a lot of people uh, enjoy it. Uh, G &T, yeah. especially on a summer so we're in a fall day a warm fall day so uh we'll be back uh with uh, a gin and tonic next on backyard bartender Hey, I'm Brian O'Connell with uh, Leslie Ann Corrigan, and we're back on Backyard Bartender. So we've made a martini, we've had a gimlet, and we're going to move along to uh, something else. What are we making this a time? A gin and tonic. Gin and tonic. Now, a G and T. I don't think there's anything quite as nice as a GNT. and I think you're right. Yeah? yeah? I think you're right. And I don't like to mess with this too much because yeah. it is so classic. Yeah. But again, um, we're going to pull on some of these local ingredients. Okay. And like I mentioned before, early on in the first segment of the show, there are companies who are, it's not just people like me or going out in their yards and, and picking spruce. So no, I, I <laughs> want to uh, just correct something. We, we talked about foraging. You forage for yourself. Oh my gosh, yes. yes. There is a whole industry yeah. of people who yeah. forage you're not a, for you're not part of that industry. No. But I I have been very lucky to profile people who yeah. are a part of that industry. And, and there are people who have written books in Newfoundland and Labrador about forage. That's right, Sean Dawson, and he wrote The Forager's Dinner, and yes. you can find him at the Farmer's Market every week, and he was actually a guest on the Outdoor Hour twice. Okay. So one time we went foraging in Trapassi during a hurricane, literally during okay. a tropical <laughs> storm. It's a great time to be in Trapassi, I will say, <laughs> on the beach. Lots just of a yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. But it was, because it was a tropical storm, yeah. it was quite warm. We just had, I was there with the folks from Legendary Coasts uh -huh. and we were doing a show. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't TV then, it was radio. So we didn't get the full effect of that tropical storm, but I think you heard it. Um, but we had these yellow, just uh, disposable raincoats. That's all we had. <laughs> and what were you looking for? So we looked for, it was amazing, Brian. And that's the thing, like people, like Sean and uh, and Cod Sounds and and these folks from the Third Place Cocktail Company, um, they are out in in everywhere 
looking for things and finding things and it's traditional knowledge that has been passed down and it's First Nations knowledge that we're starting to uncover again and it's the tastes and flavors that are around us everywhere. So we were on the beach this particular time in Trapassi and we found things that you literally walk over every day when yep. you go to the beach like? and we they were delicious. I don't know the names of them. You got to buy the book. <laughs> okay. But if I was there, I could see them and I could eat them. We made a salad and it was a great big huge salad out of things that we literally just picked up off the beach. Fantastic. Yeah, it was great. All right, so this is a gin and tonic, a classic gin and tonic. Where, where's this gin from? So this is actually from the Isle of Islay. Okay. Um, it's the remote island off of Scotland. Yeah, and I must say, this is a gift to me from a friend of mine, Pete Larden. So thank you, Pete, for that. Uh, Pete's in New Guinea right now, and he told me to put that on the bar for uh, the next time I'm making a nice uh, gin drink. So here we are. Here we are. All right, so Thank you. what goes in a G&T? So G&T, it's pretty basic, but the thing is we typically kind of reach for that tonic water, the Canada Dry or the Schweppes, yeah. which is fine. We're not yeah. gonna, but there are many other options and okay. it's nice to kind of expand your palate a little bit and try some new things, especially when these new things are made by great local companies. Sure. Um, so we're gonna use the botanist gin. We wanna put some ice in our glass first. I like okay. a nice heavy glass for mm -hmm. a gin and tonic. Okay. Um, um, and so when's the best time to enjoy a gin and tonic? Any time is a great time for a gin and tonic. I'd like to avoid <laughs> breakfast. Okay. And, but Probably fair a good game idea. after right. that. Okay. When you've got this beautiful place, I mean. So if you're home in the afternoon and it comes around to a cocktail hour before dinner, a nice gin and tonic at the end of the day. I feel like Rachel and Mac Corey been when that <laughs> happens, you know? Mix me a gin and tonic. And they remember they used to go over to the thing on the and they everybody had the cocktail decanter. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> we did these bottles are almost as lovely as yeah. these decanters. So we're just gonna do the uh, two ounces. Two ounces, okay. Yeah. Always do two. Always two. Okay. Yeah. I'll remember that. Yeah. All right. So um, two ounces of the botanist gin over ice over ice mm -hmm. and, and there's no shaking or anything that's going to happen I with this don't, no, no. I, I don't like to kind of no. this okay. i'm going to be worried about bruising the gin but i don't want like to make it any more complicated yeah. they mix well together the soda water that we're going to put in on those bubbles will kind of mix things okay. through so it, it's nice to kind of get the taste yeah. of, of the okay. the ingredients so now we're going to use the third place tonic so we want to do a full ounce of this so this isn't your, like your typical tonic water this is just the tonic essence so mm -hmm. this has essence and the ingredient the labels on these are beautiful They've researched their ingredients really well and they've presented it beautifully. Um, so you just kind of get take an ounce of this. That's all you need is an ounce. This is just the essence. And then the soda will be the water then with that. So it's as you can see, it's, it's got a bit of color to yeah, it. Sure, yeah. Not probably what you're used to with the gin and tonic. No, normally tonic is a clear. It, it, yeah, it can be, absolutely. It depends okay. on the distilling process, I guess, of this, you know, um, of the essences of that and the ingredients that they use to put into it. So then we just top this off with some soda. You don't want to drown it. Yeah. Um, again, you can't take it out once it's in there, but you can always add more to it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to garnish this. Typically, you would just use a lime. Um, I always like to kind of obviously cut the ends off your lime. Um, give yourself a, a nice cut for the glass. A nice thick lime in case you do want to use it to add to the drink. Okay. I know you can squeeze that in. If you you can okay. if you want. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's no citrus in there right now. Lots of people do kind of associate um, the gin and tonic with a nice squeeze of citrus, okay. but that's to your taste. It, I, I hate to squeeze, you know, lime in a recipe that doesn't kind of call for it sure. in case that person is really a purist, like you've said. <laughs> I'm also going to add some of the spruce to this because it's going to pick up some of the elements that are in both of these okay. that kind of complement each other. It's really neat to see companies it's kind of working together I know that it happens a lot locally but it's happening in the in the spirits industry all over um, so you get spirits kind of you know recommending the ingredients sure, to use and that sure. sort of thing so we're gonna add the spruce there to that use it as a little almost like a stick. swizzle stick it's yeah okay. beautiful all right. and there you go so this is the uh, gin and tonic with uh, locally sourced and um, some great gin from the Isle of Islay and uh, Oh, I like that. Yeah, different taste. It is, yeah. And and you, you do get that uh, little essence of lime there. You do get uh, the spruce. You you certainly get uh, the, the, the tonic, and the soda is a, a, a beautiful addition to it. And it's uh, really clean on the palate, really nice. clean on the palate. So that's your classic gin and tonic. If you would like to have a, a gin and tonic in the afternoon, uh, maybe on a, a warm fall afternoon, you'd like to sit outside and enjoy that while you're reading a book. That's certainly a, a drink to enjoy. One more question before mm -hmm. we wrap up. Where do you go foraging? 
Well, I you can actually go in your backyard. I'm fortunate to live in um, you know a bit more of a rural place. I mm -hmm. live in Whitless Bay, and I, I live right on the water, so I'm very lucky that way. Um, but you also in this beautiful setting here, you can find things in your own yard. I mean, the best and most common example of foraging, and this is something that people have done for generations here, and they didn't put a label on it. They were just calling it living. <laughs> but <laughs> but dandelion. Oh, that. Yeah, exactly. Dandelion. When those first dandelion uh, leaves come out on the ground and you're cursing them pick them eat them they're delicious and then of course as the dandelion goes through its own life cycle every part of the dandelion is edible and we don't even use it as you know we should I've, I've had that conversation with several people this spring and we were talking about uh, Newfoundlanders and dandelions and uh, they talked about how wonderful it was with Sunday dinner and ah. people would always wait for springtime and I'm old enough to remember people uh, going around fields and, and foraging for, for dandelions. So really foraging uh, comes naturally to us, you know. It's, it's one of those things that we've done here in Newfoundland and Labrador. It probably fell out of favor and now all of a sudden this is coming back into favor. Now the outdoor show is heard when and where? So it's the outdoor hour on VOCM and we're on Sunday evenings at 7 and Wednesday evenings at 5 and I just basically talk to people who work and make their living in the outdoors and do great things with what we've been given here. All right. Well, thank you Leslie Ann Corrigan you. for joining us today on Backyard Bartender. The uh, Gimlet, the Martini and the Gin and Tonic. Some great drinks. We hope you'll try them and uh, enjoy them. Uh, we'll be back to talk a little bit more about what's coming up next on Backyard Bartender. I'm Brian O'Connell. Drink responsibly, and we'll talk to you in just a moment. But not to belabor the point, but that is really one of the nicest drinks that I've had. I in, like that one, I think, too. And that Leslie Ann Corrigan uh, joining us today on uh, Backyard Bartender. So uh, we've done gimlets, we've done martinis. Oh, my goodness, we had uh, some uh, fabulous drinks in previous shows. We talked about uh, beers from Newfoundland and Labrador, the craft beer industry, how that is after taking off in Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, we also have uh, coming up some uh, truly amateur mixologists. And uh, these are people who are... Uh, have no professional affiliation or have never worked behind an actual working bar mm. but uh, they're going to join us in a, a couple of episodes and uh, make some of their favorite drinks drinks that uh, as uh, Ricky one of our guests uh, Ricky Lopez said uh, a lot of these cocktails that he was making were drinks that were uh, concocted by uh, customers in bars they said this is the drink I like I tried it at home can you make it for me and next thing you know you have a drink named after you so uh, that's coming up on a future episode of uh, Backyard Bar Tender. I'm Brian O'Connell. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back with another episode real soon. Stay safe, everybody. Be well, be kind, and uh, drink responsibly. And we'll see you next time here on Backyard Bartender. Cheers. Cheers. about this program.